Information, please. A new type of question and answer game. How many miles are there in a light year? Approximately 5,865,696,000,000. Amazing! Elementary. A friend of mine asked me, by what cognomen would you designate the Homo sapiens seminar I perceived in your escortage yesterday evening? Would you please tell me what he meant? He merely asked, who is that lady I saw you with last night? Amazing! Elementary. Yes, folks, during the next half hour, the public asks amazing questions, and a group of experts assembled here are supposed to make them elementary. We present tonight the first in a series of programs called Information, Please, a new type question and answer contest in which you, the very much quiz public, will quiz the professors. Yes, the worm turns, and now the experts will have to know the answers to your questions or else. Or else, you win five dollars. Now, here's how it's done. You send us questions and the correct answers. If our editors find them proper and fair, they will be presented to a panel board of experts for the first time during each broadcast. If your questions are used, you are entitled to $2 for each one and $5 additional if the board fails to answer your question correctly. Now, there are other rules governing this contest, but I'm going to let our master of ceremonies, Clifton Fadiman, give you that information. Mr. Fadiman, the book critic of the New Yorker magazine, has read thousands of books, so we figure he can handle even our quartet of mental giants. I want you to meet our intellectual Simon Legree, the Tuscanini of quiz, Clifton Fadiman. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Before I give you any more details regarding the rules of information, please... Let me tell you about the Board of Experts for tonight's broadcast. They face me. First, Bernard Jaffe, head of the Physical Science Department of Bushwood High School. Mr. Jaffe is author of a number of books of popular science, including Crucibles, Outposts of Science, which are two of the best known. Next, we have Mr. Marcus Duffield, day news editor of the Herald Tribune, and the last word on current events, politics, history, and so forth. You have several questions about and so forth from Mr. Duffield this evening. <laughs> Third, we have uh, Dr. Harry Overstreet, a genuine dyed-in-the-wool professor of philosophy at the College of the City of New York, and author of a great many books. Influencing Human Behavior is one that you may remember. And finally, we have Franklin P. Adams, known to millions, I wouldn't be exaggerating if I said thousands, <laughs> as uh, FPA, creator of the famous humorous column, The Conning Tower, which will shortly appear regularly in the New York Evening Post. Mr. Adams is an unbeatable authority on popular songs and batting averages. He admits it himself. Here they sit, these four towering intellects. On their faces is a look of confidence, <laughs> which I believe to be entirely false. <laughs> Now, folks, any education that you and I may pick up for the next half hour or so is all to the good. But beyond that, we're out simply to play this as a game and have some fun at it. Now about the board's part in this contest. We guarantee absolutely, and we mean absolutely, that the questions will be shot at them now for the first time without any previous warning. These questions will be addressed to the entire board. Any member wishing to answer them may raise his hand and do so or try to do so. If any member undertakes to answer a question, he must stand on his own. Other members of the board may not offer any assistance unless I ask for help. Now about the $5. The $5 penalty for an expert's failure to answer a question completely will be paid out from a kitty of $100 set up for each broadcast. And to make sure that the board works hard on each question, it's understood that what is left of the $100 kitty, if any, after penalties are paid goes to the board for refreshment, such as a fine, cool glass of milk and a cookie. <laughs> when you hear that cash register sound, let me hear that again, it sounds very good. That means $5 is actually being paid out to the lucky questioner, if he's here, or it will be sent to him if he is. Now, there are a number of people here in the studio waiting to address that question to the board. There are some questions we've received from out-of-town listeners, and these will be presented to the board by your master of ceremonies. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we are ready for the first question. All set, Mr. Jaffe, Mr. Duffield, Dr. Overstreet, Mr. Adams. Here she comes. Morty Bauman of New York City will put the first question. Mr. Bauman. The following women are important figures in the present administration. Miss Frances Perkins, 
Mrs. Nellie Ross, and Mrs. J. Borden Harriman. Can you give the positions occupied by at least two of these women? Well, just to be on the safe side, you see, we're starting off with a tribute to the ladies. I'll repeat that question to Mr. Barman. The following women are important figures in the present administration. Ms. Frances Perkins, Mrs. Nellie Ross, and Mrs. J. Borden Harriman. Can you name the positions occupied by at least two of them? Mr. Duffield's hand is up at once. Mr. Duffield. I believe I can, Mr. Fadiman. Yes. Uh, this is Nellie Taylor Ross, is director of the Mint. Uh, Madam Perkins is uh, secretary of, uh, of labor. And uh, Mrs. J. Borden Harriman is uh, chairman of the Women's Committee of the Democratic Party. Chairman of the Women's Committee of the Democratic Party is a new one on me. I have a list of here as Minister to Norway. We'd better make up our minds. Uh-oh. <laughs> I think she is Minister to Norway, and uh, unless there is something, some evidence of the contrary, we'll have to ring up $5, which goes to Mr. Morty Bauman of New York City. Mm. Mm. Answer two out of three. Correct. Two out of three allows us to keep the $5 for that glass of milk, Mr. Dover. <laughs> The next one comes to us from the home of culture, and it guesses where that is, Boston, Massachusetts. <laughs> comes from Mr. George Smith. Correct the following line and name its author. And the line is, in the spring, a young man's fancy always turns to thoughts of love. Mr. Adams. In the spring, a young man's fancy likely turns to thoughts of love. Very, very neat. Very, very neat. Can you tell us... Uh, can you tell us, Mr. Adams, what is the source of that remark about love? That was written by Alfred Lord Tennyson. Well, see whether you know any more about it. And do you know in what poem it appears? I think I have him there. But he saved us from losing five dollars all the same. Locksley Hall. Very good indeed. <laughs> Sounds very much like a put-up job, but I assure you it's quite honest. Anyone looking at Mr. Adams' face will know that he's quite, quite honest. <laughs> now, the next question uh, will be delivered, given to us, by Mr. Maxwell Garnett of New York. Mr. Garnett. Uh, why would it never be necessary for the man in the moon, if married to a chatterbox, to tell her to shut up? <laughs> That's a puzzler. I'm going to repeat it, see whether I understand it myself. <laughs> why would it never be necessary for the man in the moon... If married to a chatterbox, to tell her to shut up. Now, that happens to be an easy one. Oh, Mr. Jaffe, the scientist. <laughs> there is no atmosphere on the moon, and it requires air to transmit sound waves. Therefore, she can talk from today until doomsday, and nobody will hear her. Nevertheless, I'm looking over that question. It seems to me there's a catch in it. Because the real chatterbox on the moon would be able to create enough hot air of her own to uh, allow her own atmosphere, don't you think? That's a rather weak science there, Mr. Potterman. It's the best I can do this evening, Mr. Jaffe. The next uh, question comes to us from Miss Vera Ciruti of New York City. She's going to ask the question herself. Miss Ciruti. Uh, in what well-known symphony did the composer include a chord in order to awaken a sleeping audience? That's one for musicians. I'll repeat that one. In what well-known symphony did the composer include a chord in order to awaken a sleeping audience? Mr. Adams. <clears throat> the Surprise Symphony. Well, that's a surprise answer. <laughs> correct, too. Who wrote it? <laughs> Haydn. Very good, indeed. I thought you knew only batting averages, Mr. Adams. I know all. <laughs> <laughs> the Surprise Symphony by Joseph Haydn is correct. The next question comes to us from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, from Miss Dorothy Curtis. I'll read it for her. Here is a quotation from Rudyard Kipling. Give the next line. For a woman is only a woman, dot, 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 dot. Volunteers, Mr. Adams again, the bright boy of the class this evening. <laughs> but a good cigar is a smoke. Very good indeed. That is great. <laughs> You've been so clever on Lashley Hall, I'm going to ask you what poem that comes from, Mr. Adams. We've won five dollars so far. Don't worry too much. <laughs> I don't know, but it begins, open the old cigar box. I didn't ask you that. <laughs> it comes from a poem, The Betroth, in case this ever comes up again next week or some other time. The Betroth. The uh, 
next question will be read to us, invented by Mr. Wally Freed of Long Island. Mr. Freed. How is the immigration to the United States from the following nations restricted? England, Brazil, China. I'll repeat that question. How is immigration to the United States from the following nations restricted? England, Brazil, China. Do I see a look of intelligence on your face, Mr. Garfield? Doesn't look very intelligent to me, no. Don't see that question. I pass. You pass. <laughs> Anybody bit for space? <laughs> Dr. Overstreet. I'm down. <laughs> Dr. Jaffe, you That's follow my field. <laughs> now, Mr. Adams, you have no field. I didn't know there was any immigration. No immigration. <laughs> Looks very, very much to me as if I would have to ask the gentleman back here to ring up five dollars. Five dollars is going to Mr. Wally Freed of Long Island at this very moment. <laughs> And now, ladies and gentlemen, I don't want to keep you in the dark any longer. I am going to give you the valuable answer to this extremely significant question. How is immigration to the United States from the following nations restricted? England, Brazil, China. It's restricted in the case of England by quota. In the case of Brazil, there is no restriction. And in the case of China, none are admitted, but they may come on a temporary visit and remain for a limited time, which makes the future of the chow mein business look pretty dark. <laughs> The next question comes to us from Mr. Gordon Kahn of Brooklyn, New York. Kahn will read his question himself. What kind of fathead can be boiled in oil with impunity? Do I believe my ears? <laughs> <laughs> what kind of fathead can be boiled in oil with impunity? I suppose impunity is some sort of sauce that you boil along with oil. <laughs> what kind of fathead can be boiled in oil with impunity? Gentlemen, I'm going to give you ten seconds on that one. The head of the calf. I beg your pardon? C-A-L-F. C-A-L-F. No. I haven't got that down on my notes here. Must be wrong. What kind of fat head can be boiled in oil with impunity? That impunity is what stumps me. <laughs> Who let that fat head in here anyway? <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Jaffe, it seems to me that ought to be in your line. You're a chemist. Are you calling me a fathead? <laughs> <laughs> seems to me that an atmosphere of general insult is already established. <laughs> in order to pour oil with impunity on the troubled waters, I will now tell you that the kind of fathead that can be boiled in oil, thank you very much, is a fish named fathead to be found off the coast of California. Mm -hmm. Now, Mr. Gordon Kahn, who has just received uh, the sum of five dollars, offers no explanation whatsoever of why these fatheads should stick around the coast of California rather than go any other place. Miss Fanny Berger of Brooklyn, New York, is here with a question. With what is each of the following expressions associated? Big four, big six, big ten. I'll repeat that question. A very good one. With what is each of the following expressions associated? Big four, big six, big ten. Mr. Adams again. A railroad... Uh, uh, what one are you referring to, Adam? The big a four. A railroad. Go ahead. The Topographical Union. For what one? Big six. Yeah. And big ten, I think I just saved the five dollars. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> just saved the five dollars by getting two out of three, you think? As a matter of fact, uh, Mr. Adams gets just, just a slightly less than two out of three. We might let it go by, though. The big four represents a railroad train, a particular one on the Michigan Central. You admit that, don't you, Mr. Adams? No. You don't admit it. <laughs> There's no time for you and I to have a struggle. The big four ordinarily, however, is applied to the four principal statesmen at the World War Conference. Lloyd George, Orlando, Clement. I thought it was so and Wilson. Otherwise, it may be applied to the railroad train on the Michigan Central, according to my notes. 
If you don't admit that, we lose...